Hello. I, uh... Yeah, yeah. that's your yeah. name. Squirrels got me. Big Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Cold and fun. That's good that you think that of it because that's what deer hunting typically is, is cold and fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday morning, I'm glassing up on the pass and I see these deer moving. And I'm like, ooh, there's deer moving. All of a sudden, I just see this person just head down, just hauling ass wearing shorts and a t-shirt with a pack on. And I'm like, I'm like, is that hard? My dad always talks about floating through the woods like the autumn breeze. So, so Robert's when you're the 275 pounds, I don't know how you do that, but. The Freightliner. <laughs> It's just like a creeper. He's kind of up in the corner watching what's going on down there. Yeah. You know? He's like, <laughs> you know, he's up there slapping it, pissing all over everything. Is it warm yet? <laughs> How did you know the name of the actor? That's what I know. How did you say his name? Her Hervé Velichos. <laughs> <laughs> you know what Pertinier means? If you know what Pertinier means and you live in America, you're a redneck too. <laughs> Welcome to the Log Talk Podcast, brought to you by Pertnir Outdoors. It's that time of year. It's that time of year where we all need to be thinking about, do we have everything we need to hit the woods? Chances are you don't, and if you think you do, you probably could use some more. So how about you go over to thehuntworks.com and check out all the incredible products these guys are carrying. Uh, this is a great family, local store. Uh, Dan and Steve Dunnigan, a couple hardworking some bitches. They are now carrying archery equipment, everything from bows to arrows to broadheads, quivers, you name it. So on top of all the great tree stands and box blinds that they're carrying, they're now a full full on archery dealer. And really recommend that you check these guys out for your next big purchase. Uh, head over to thehuntworks.com to see what they've got for sale. Or if you're local in the Rochester area, head on over to their store in East Rochester on Despatch Drive and check them out. They are on social media, The Hunt Works, and also online, like I said. And if you purchase anything online, you can use promo code FEEDNAM to get 5% off. And that's F-E-E-D, FEEDN, I-N-U-M, 5% off. FEEDNAM. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of the Pertinier Outdoors podcast. I am Billy, your humble host, and I am looking forward to this discussion very much to get it out there and share it over the airwaves to our listeners and hopefully some new listeners that might uh, stumble across this podcast uh, because of what the topic is and who we had on. Uh, this is going to be a topic about soil health, uh, in food plot, you know, it's kind of what we're, we're, we're obviously doing. We're deer farming over here, but, uh, but we got in, we wanted to get an expert on here. Uh, Keith Burns joined us from green cover seed and, uh, we've been using their product for a couple of years now. And, uh, Dallas has been following along quite a bit with him. So we wanted to get him on here to kind of give the, uh, the basics of soil health and some of the key principles that he, uh, that he believes are the important, uh, the most important pieces to having, healthy soil and what we can do as deer farmers, as big ag uh, farmers in, in particular, uh, what we can do to improve soil health and in, in, in return uh, help the environment. So very beneficial conversation. This went for about an hour. And the second hour, uh, when Keith had to jump off, he had another call. Uh, but Dallas and I decided to keep the, the podcast rolling. And we wanted to, uh, we just kind of Started riffing, covered all kinds of stuff. Got we ground some gears, which I know is uh, one of my favorite things to do with Dallas. Is you know see what's grinding his gears. So of course we did that, and uh, and uh, then that was that was the podcast. So you guys will hear that here in just a moment. Um, I think I'm going to keep this intro brief since we got a two hour show coming at you. Uh, had another great show uh, recorded today that we will be getting out uh, next week sometime. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And uh, we are working on getting a T-shirt and hat order uh, put together to get some stuff up. We've been uh, kicking the can on that for a little bit too long. So what we're going to be doing, it's going to be the Feeding Them uh, design that we used for the beer can. It will be, uh, it will be that logo on the front of a T-shirt and or a hoodie. And then we're going to have some hats made, which will be some Richardson hats with that same PVC uh, rubber patch that we put on 
uh, those hats a couple of years ago that were a huge hit. So we're going to do some sort of a, a standard color, uh, whether it be green, gray, or black. I'm not quite sure yet. I'll probably just come down to whatever's available. But then we're going to do another run of those Blaze Orange uh, Richardson hats. They were a huge hit. It's one of my favorite hats. Uh, I wear it all the time during gun season. So we're going to get another batch of those made up. Um, let's see, what else is there? I'm going to be selling a bunch of my camo. Uh, I know I posted about that on social last night uh, that I was going to be doing that. Reason being is uh, if you know who Jocko Willink is or if you've been following along with that or maybe you know what Origin, what that company is, it's a, a, a company that he's part of, uh, but it's a American-made brand. Uh, they do, they're do. they very proud about what they're doing. They're trying to bring back American manufacturing for textiles. So they've been doing, uh, you know, jeans and boots and, uh, and MMA clothing for several years now. Uh, I use a bunch of their supplements and have been for a couple of years. But I was very excited when I heard about a year, year and a half ago that they were going to get into hunting uh, clothing. And last night was their was their pre-order launch for that. So I jumped in and uh, decided that I wanted to go all in. I love what they're doing with the, with the layering system. Uh, it's very similar to what I've run in the past with Sitka and then this past year with Forlo. Um, so I decided what the hell, I might as well just give the whole thing a shot. So I basically am looking to replace my entire wardrobe of camouflage with this stuff from Origin. Uh, so I'm pretty pumped about that to try something new. I've had a few people ask me, you know, like, oh, why'd you do that? I thought you were all in on, on Forlo. Um, I, it's not that I wasn't all in on Forlo. I was all, all in on them last year. I sold a bunch of my Sitka stuff the year before and bought some, uh, some stuff from Forlo. And I, I wore the living snot out of that and, and, uh, the stuff held up great. Uh, the quality of the product is, was really, I had no complaints about the quality of the product. Um, I'm just excited. I've, I've been a Jocko uh, fan for a long time and a user of the Origin products uh, when it comes to the uh, supplements for a long time. So I'm very excited to be able to jump on with a company that I'm already a believer in what they do and what they stand for. And uh, I'm, I'm just excited to try that. So that's my reasoning for going that direction. And uh, those of you that are close to me are not surprised. They, they were just waiting to find out what I was going to, what I was going to do and, and what I was going to spend on this new gear. So I'm excited to get it in. I'm probably going to be one of the few people, uh, probably the only one in our hunting group that's going to have it. So I'll be able to kind of talk about it and test it out and see what I think of it. And uh, we'll go from there. So if you're interested in any any uh, large tops or uh, 34 waist bottoms, uh, I got a bunch of stuff I'm going to be posting uh, on social of things I'm looking to move and sell to help cover my expenses of jumping into something new. So we've got that. And... Last thing on the beer note, we still have some beer there. I know that there was a big old batch that we made up at Windy Brew, so there is still some Feeding and Pilsner available. So if you uh, are interested, you know, you can reach out to us if you're not local and you want to try to figure out a way to get some. Or if you uh, are, are local here in western New York and want to swing out to Windy Brew, they've got a bunch of it uh, on tap and canned up and ready to go home with you. So that's all I got for this week. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this discussion, please uh, share it. We would really appreciate that. I think this is one that all uh, all people who are probably listening to this podcast that have any property uh, on the private end that you are passionate about trying to improve the environment on the ground and help the health of your deer and turkey and and uh, and different animals that you might pursue on your property. Uh, this is very important. I think this is the base and the ground groundwork of of what will get us to having higher quality uh, habitat and and healthy deer in the end of the day so enjoy the chat thank you so much appreciate you listening keep feeding them i'm doing well good that looks like some pretty fancy setups you guys got there oh we're fooling you right off the bat huh (laughs) yeah we we try to fake it till we make it you know Uh, yeah we're excited we're actually just talking about that saying here earlier this week Faking it till you that's, make it. That's a lot of what we end up doing. Yeah. Well, we're uh, we're like two and a half years in. Well, we're two years into this podcast. No, more than that. 2019. So we're like three years into this, and just little by little, you keep getting getting better. You keep buying new equipment and you know expanding yourself. So yeah, we're getting there. Sure. You guys uh, 
try to drop one once a week or how often do you do that? Yeah, we're about on the once a week schedule. We during hunting season we've tried to like ramp that up and you know, sometimes we'll do a couple episodes a week and that gets to be a bit much when you're trying to do everything that uh that hunting season entails. So Yeah. We're uh we're kind of fine in our pace. But you know, at the end of the day it comes down to there's only so much time for people to consume content too. So we're trying to make sure what we're putting out is valuable and, and, uh, you know, bringing t- value to both ourselves and the people who are listening. So. Yep. Yep. So I'm, so my name, I'm Billy Harvey. I'm the, I'm the host of the podcast and sit next to me is Dallas Kirsch. So he's, he's a hunting buddy. Uh, one of, he's become one of my best friends. It's my, I met Dallas through my wife and, uh, we call him the deer farmer of the family. He's pretty passionate. And, uh, He's excited to have you on here today, Keith, because you're like one of his heroes. So he's uh, he's really excited to talk to you. Just warning you. Man, you need to expand your horizons a little bit, I think. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's my pleasure to be on. Yeah. So we're so just so you know, we're uh, we're broadcasting live on an app called Bullhorn, which is what we're on right now, and uh, it's also uh, streaming live on our Facebook page, and the video will be available up on there afterwards, as well as our YouTube channel. So. Um, if you want, I think a good place to start would be to just kind of introduce yourself and, uh, and hear a little bit about the background of who you are and, and what, uh, what you do. Sure. Yeah. Be glad to do that. So my name is Keith Burns. Uh, my brother and I farm here in South central Nebraska. And then about 14 years ago, we started a cover crop seed company. We call the green cover seed. And we started the cover crop seed company as a response to doing some experiments with cover crops here on our own farm. So we grew up on the farm right here. So we've been here all our lives, Uh, but just knew there was something missing from our farming operation. So we started experimenting with cover crops, really liked what we saw, uh, particularly with how it could benefit the livestock, the cattle herd and and when we started doing this, seed was really hard to find. And so we decided to start the seed business to try to make this seed avail- available, partly because we wanted to be able to have seed for ourselves. Yeah. That's a lot of times how these things start. Uh, but then the demand just kept growing and growing and growing. And so we have uh, grown it from, in 2009, we sold enough cover crop seed to cover about 1,000 acres. And last year, 2000. 21, we moved enough seed out the door to cover about a million acres. Oh my lord! And uh, we're on pace to you know grow that hopefully by 15, 20 percent even this year. And so uh, the demand for cover crops uh, is growing because of soil health, uh, regenerative ag. Those are kind of buzzwords that lots of people know and talk about. But but really, basically, it's it's following the principles that God established when He created the plants to grow together in conjunction with the biology. And so we're really just trying to restore the natural order. If you will, if you will, we're trying to bring uh, some of those, uh, what you would find the concepts that are happening in, in native uh, uh, pastures or native uh, woodlands. We're trying to bring those back into a cropping situation and, and trying to do it in little small segments in between crops. That, that's what cover crops basically are. And then, you know, of course, a lot of the same things that we're using for our farmers and ranchers are the exact same things that were being used in, in food plots. Because, uh, again, the principles don't change just because the animals do. And so uh, we may need to use different plants to be highly attractive and beneficial to deer than what I would with cattle or with sheep or with goats, that you can tweak each of those just a little bit. But the principles remain the same in that we want to keep the ground covered and we want to have a living root out there all the time and we want to maximize our diversity and we really want to minimize the amount of disturbance in the system, whether that be uh, physical disturbance through tillage or what a lot of people don't understand is that we also want to minimize, not eliminate, but minimize the amount of chemical disturbance through herbicides and even uh, <clears throat> commercial synthetic fertilizers can can disturb the biological communities that we've created. So that's kind of our background and our journey. You know, we started with uh, just my brother and I and a couple of the kids helping us out. And now we've got 55 employees and 
couple different locations and are shipping seed to all 50 states and most of Canada. And so it's really been a fun journey. We've uh, got to meet a lot of cool people along the way. Uh, and, and one of the things that we've always really stressed is, is education. You know, our, the vast, vast majority of our marketing budget goes directly to education because we've always felt like if people understand what's going on in the soil, how that soil functions, the only logical conclusion they can come to is they have to have a plant growing as much as possible. And if it's not going to be a cash crop that they're going to harvest, then it needs to be a cover crop. And that's, that's where cover crops kind of fill that niche. So I, I want Dallas. So, so you can kind of understand uh, how we came upon you. And, uh, and I think that there's a lot of correlation to yeah. how you got into what you're doing and kind of how we have gotten into it. So I want to give Dallas a chance because this is really a discussion I kind of want him to lead because he's the one that grew up on the farm. He's the one that has a background and who's so passionate about what he's learning from you. So I kind of want you to kind of now explain to Keith the same sort of idea that he just explained to us. Sure. So a, a little background on us is that um, we live in western New York, and it's a it's an ag area. So it's there's it used to be dominated all by dairy. Now it's probably half and half between dairy and cash crop, but it's you know a lot of it's your basic corn, bean, wheat rotation. Mo- probably more corn beans than anything, and a lot of a lot of hay baling. Mm-hmm. And then on the eggs on the uh, dairy side, you know you're seeing a lot of silage, corn and hay silage chopping, and then a little leftover cash crop. Um, and then my background personally is I grew up on a dairy farm here in western New York, and at one time we milked about 250 cows, but the, the dairy business is gone, and they went to just a cash crop rotation with hay bale and uh, corn and soybeans and a little bit of wheat. But my father and Billy's father-in-law who owned the farm, they just recently retired and sold off some of the, the farmable land. Fortunately, that's stayed in the family, so we, we kind of still have the, the farm existing as it was. Um, but the rest of it's kind of become a deer farm, which, you know, that's our other side of our background is that I grew up, you know, my family, my brother and my dad and me, we grew up uh, pretty passionate whitetail hunters. And, you know, as we get older, that's that's sort of, that's the lane that we've stayed in, you know, uh, to the point where, Billy's got a podcast that we pretty much just talk about whitetail hunting all year round. So, but from the farming side, um, okay, so I guess I, I guess I would start by saying how I came across you and Green Cover yeah. Seed, which is it directly through Growing Deer TV, Dr. Grant Woods. I know that, that you guys have a relationship with him and that now you're his seed supplier and he... Um, he helps design the food plot mixes for you. So um, that's a door that you guys opened up probably within only the last year or two where you are directly in the food plot and whitetail deer industry now, even if it's just through what Grant is doing. But I'll tell you, he's opened up a, a wide new customer base for you. And and not just customers, because I'm sure that what you're selling for seed on the on the food plot side is probably nowhere, you know, it's probably a, a minute percentage of your business that you're doing, but it's opening a lot of eyes to this whole regenerative ag is really where I go. Yeah. I've kind of, it's since following, you know, Grant and starting to follow some of your stuff, I've actually gone down a rabbit hole of this regenerative <laughs> ag and I've become actually Be careful. So a lot of people never come up from that hole. <laughs> so I, it's funny because it happens. I'm not the only one that it. I just I find the whole thing so fascinating, and especially with my background, the way that I grew up on a farm, and in the way we did things. And um, you know, we started out in more conventional when I was a kid, but you know, then we we moved to, more towards no-till. But the cover crops were a very limited thing. And I guess that's that's what I really notice around here with the farms is that there's limited cover crops, and I feel like the, and there's challenges with where we live with the short growing season, high rainfall, high snow amount. So we we have challenges that people deal with, but the cover crop side of things here is, you know, generally people are planting winter wheat, 
and if it if they're doing it at all, they're planting winter wheat and then they're killing it the, as soon as the ground dries up a little bit, so that they can either till or no till into that wheat stubble. Yeah. Um, so I I feel like that's kind of missing in this area, but you know to back up a little bit, like I say, that's the, the way that we just the way that we came across you and and with what you're doing on the food plot side is I think it, that's really has opened a lot of eyes. Yeah. You know, it's, it's been a, it's been a great couple of years with, uh, with our relationship with Grant and, uh, you know, we kind of, our paths kind of have crossed, you know, uh, peripherally in the past, mostly because we're both kind of preaching the same message with, you know, regenerative ag and, and, uh, and then a couple of years ago he came to us and, and we really got down to business you know, we know, we know plants really, really well. He, he knows what plants the deer will eat really, really well. And so by bringing those two things together, bringing our experience from the ag side, his experience from the deer side, uh, we've, been, we've really been able to do some, some pretty cool, cool stuff. And, and I think one of the reasons that it works so well is, you know, our, our company mission statement is regenerating God's, you know, helping people regenerate God's creation for future generations. And, you know, his is, you know, enjoy creation and know the creator. And so there's just a lot of synergy from, you know, mindsets and, and missions. But I told Grant, I said, you know, watching your, I was watching some of your videos, and particularly when he's talking about the soil, I said, you could give that talk at any of the soil health conferences that I go to with all farmers and, and it would be a great talk because, again, it's the same principles. Doesn't matter if you're in, you know, Western New York or you know the Branson, Missouri area or, or Central Nebraska. Those principles are going to work wherever you're at. <clears throat> now, the practices that you need to use to get yourself there, they're going to be a little different. You know, the the best food plot mixes for your area, they're going to be a little different than what we would use here for a livestock operation or that you know maybe what Grant would use. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the timing, not necessarily the species, but the timing. And so, you know, we've been able to bring a lot of that knowledge and experience from working with customers all across the North America and, and kind of mesh and mold that with what Grant's doing. But, but the, the messages are very consistent in that, you know, it's a soil health principles, keep the soil covered, keep a living root in the ground as often as possible, be as diverse as possible and to minimize that disturbance that we talked about. And then the fifth principle is, you know, to integrate livestock, which of course with the, with the deer guys, you know, their livestock is coming to them. And then there's kind of a sixth principle that gets talked about a lot. And that's just know the context of what you're doing. And, and that's why you have to understand what is going to work best in your area and for your special circumstances. So when those principles are followed, lots of success can happen. So you've already, you've already listed the principles twice here, so I don't want to make you repeat it too much, but what I, one of the first things I wanted to do was I, I really just want to take this conversation more in the soil health direction and away from the food plots and the deer hunting yeah. for a little while because we beat that stuff to death a little bit. You know, we just had a podcast on Tuesday night about food plots, and it feels like about the ninth one we've done this year. <laughs> so I really just... You know, it, it, obviously it all ties together, and, and we'll talk deer a little bit, but really I'd like to have you go and spend a little bit more time on these soil health principles one at a time, and, and just and more than just listing them, give us a, a minute or two on why each one is so important and what it means and how they all work together. Sure. Well, first of all, let me just uh, – we, we do put out a soil health resource guide every year. Nice. They're completely free. If uh, you can get them on our website, you can download PDFs, uh, or you can request. We'll we'll send out a printed copy of the newest ones. Uh, this is our eighth edition, and you can just go to greencover.com and go to our resources page to get that. But but what I wanted to show on here, I don't know how well this will show up on the camera, but in each of these issues, we have full articles about each of these soil health principles. So this one is on know your context, and and then you know, keep the soil covered, minimize disturbance. And what we like to do is with each issue, we want to cover the same topic, but it's a different person that's writing that article. 
And so sometimes it's from a farmer's perspective. Sometimes it'll be from a scientist's perspective. Uh, so, you know, we'll certainly discuss them, but it just, if people want to take a little bit deeper dive, they can download those all from our website completely for free. So anyway, yeah, you know, the, uh, initially everybody just talked about the five main soil principles, but I do want to start out with the context one because it is so important. Uh, and, and it's one that, uh, Gabe Brown and Ray Archuleta, uh, they, they founded an organization called Understanding Ag, and they're consultants within this space, and they've really preached this one. So they've really brought this to prominence. But I really like it because the context is just simply knowing what's your climate, you know, what's your growing conditions, what is your goal for trying to plant these, whether it's a food plot, uh, you know, in your guys' world, or whether it's a cattle or a sheep guy in my world, or it might just be a row crop farmer. You know, the context is what do you want to try to accomplish? What are your goals? And then what are the environmental constraints that you're working within? Your rainfall, your, your when, how are you going to terminate it and when? So, you know, we're not going to solve that problem here. Certainly, it's something that each person has to kind of figure out on their own. But we really want to stress that because too many people think there's these, these magic beans that they can plant and it will solve all their problems. And... Unfortunately, it's just not that easy. You know, certainly having plants growing out there are gonna solve a lot of your problems, but to get the right plants planted at the right depth and at the right time and in the right situation, you know, that takes a lot of management. Cover crops, cover crops will increase the level of management that you're gonna to have to do, whether it's on a 10,000 acre farm or an eighth of an acre, it is gonna require additional management over just you know, tilling and spraying and burning, those are all fairly simple and straightforward. Everybody knows how to do those. Now, they're pretty destructive, but they're fairly straightforward and simple. So this requires a little bit more management. Now, the good thing is, is with people like Grant out there, you know, just really showing step-by-step -step how to do it. In fact, he's going through a, a series right now where he's starting, you know, from the ground and just here's how you clear a food plot, or at least here's how we do it. There's many ways to do it. And so he is showing the context of how he's doing it, uh, which I think is going to be very valuable for people who are just beginning. And he's doing all of this, this, this new little project that he's doing. He's doing it all with hand tools because he recognizes that a lot of people aren't going to have tractors and drills and roller crimpers. So he's really trying to step people through. Here's how you can do this with a limited amount of investment, uh, but probably a maximum amount of labor to do it because it is hard work as, as you guys well know. So that's kind of that first one that we talk about is just the context and, you know, every situation is going to be just a bit different and you will be doing yourself a disservice if you don't put a little bit of time into doing some research about exactly what you need. And, 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 you know, YouTube is, you know, there's a lot of yuck on YouTube, but there's a lot of great stuff. I mean, it's a treasure trove. <clears throat> I think anything that I need to fix in my house or on my car anymore, I can find somebody on YouTube has made a video of how to do that. And I'm very grateful for that because, you know, you used to, you know, just really have to make a lot of mistakes and sh struggle on your own to figure that out. So anyway, that's kind of that first principle is know the context of what you're dealing with so that you can make intelligent decisions or at least get connected with people who can help you make those decisions about what's gonna work best, whether it be seed or where to put your food plot or you know how to do this, everything is context uh, derived. And then as we move into the to, to more of the agronomic soil health principles, you know, and I've I've seen people list these in different ways. And and I heard somebody just the other day that they think the most important one is, you know, keep keep a plant growing at all times that you can. And you know, you could make an argument for any of those, but the one I always start first with and, and list first is keep the soil covered because I've seen way too many situations, uh, even in no-till, okay? So people think no-till is the answer, but we've got neighbors. You probably have people, uh, you know, there's people all over that are doing this. They're not tilling the ground, but because they're raking up and bailing up and removing all the residue, basically that ground is bare. Yep. And, and then it blows, it washes away. You lose so many benefits when you remove the residue. And tillage is certainly going to do that. There's no doubt about that. 
but we can have bare ground even without tillage is the point that I want to make. And so it's so important that we keep the soil covered. Number one, it keeps the sunlight, the direct sunlight off the soil. Sunlight is great for plants. Plants mm-hmm. need it to do photosynthesis. Sunlight is bad for the soil as far as directly hitting it because it, it heats it up, it dries it out, uh, it, it, it bakes it, it cooks it, it, it makes it so hot that it's going to start killing off your biology. So sunlight is a great thing for your system, but only if it's hitting a green leaf. If sunlight's not hitting a green leaf, number one, you're wasting it, and number two, it's actually probably harming your overall system. So. Sometimes it's a real struggle to keep the soil covered, particularly if you're in drier areas or if you're in a large part of the country right now that's experiencing pretty severe drought. It's it's hard, and you're not always going to accomplish it, but it should always be your goal. Mm-hmm. And and to to be able to do that, you're going to have to figure out either how to eliminate tillage or at least get something growing right away again if you do have to do a little bit of tillage. Um, but, but it's always to just keep that soil covered. So, you know, I'm curious in you guys' experience, you know, how have you seen, you know, keeping the soil covered? How have you seen that kind of lived out in your own situations there in New York? Uh, food plot wise, I'm doing that now, but, um, but I'm, I'm probably one of the few farmers, if you want to call me a farmer in the area, <laughs> that's, farmer, Dale. <laughs> that's actually doing it because we've, we've got the same thing going on as you as you mentioned, um, there's there's so many good points there, but the keeping the soil covered is something that people here struggle with. And part of it's tillage, and part of it is just the fact that a lot of guys here are feeding cows, so they're taking every bit of crop off of their fields that they can, and certainly that's that's something that's easy to understand why they're doing that, but it's hard to, it, you know, I can understand where especially dairy or you know, cattle guys have problems with keeping the soil covered because everything they're growing, they're trying to feed to their cattle. And hardly anyone here is doing any grazing other than just a typical pasture situation where they're just letting them eat the grass right down to nothing and then moving them to the next paddock. You know, nobody's really doing... I shouldn't say nobody. I'm sure there's people doing it, but in a a wide range, you're not seeing a lot of guys that that are... managing cattle in a way that they're not just taking from the, the pastures. They're just letting them eat it till there's no food left, and then they're moving it to another one, or they're bringing food into the pasture. Yeah, and what's what's interesting for me is as I'm – so Dallas Dallas preemptively for this conversation had me watch a couple of your uh, lectures. And so yesterday I'm driving around. I, I travel for work, so I'm on the road all day, and I'm, it's all ag land. So I'm driving around, and now I'm, like, super aware of all these fields that – like right now, middle of summer, that have nothing in them. Yeah. So you don't, I don't know what's going on with those fields, but you start like paying attention. It's no different than when you start becoming aware of issues of, you know, whether it's uh, the emerald ash borer or something that's we've had big problems with gypsy moths yeah. out here the last couple of years. So once you become aware of these things, then all of a sudden you start paying attention to it. So I'm driving around looking at these fields, and I'm like, oh, my yeah. gosh, look at all these fields that are completely barren, like bare dirt right now, yeah. middle of summer. So a lot of what that is is wheat. You know, our wheat crop just came off in the last uh, three weeks or so. And a, a lot of guys just leave their wheat fields fallow all the way until next year, which is just, that's that's one of the biggest opportunities that I see wasted around here is fallow yeah, wheat absolutely. fields. Um, now, some guys, like our, our farm's got like a 50-acre wheat field on it that hasn't, they haven't done anything yet except for inject manure into it. And I'm assuming they're going to put a seeding into it, a fall seeding. So they'll at least be doing something with it. But even still, there's a month already there where there's no plants growing in that soil. And <clears throat> I like the term harvesting sunlight. I think I might have got that from Grant where it exactly, you know, that you said that uh, sunlight is good for plants and bad for soil. And it's and it's obvious. But if you think of it as having a green, so now you're you're touching on all these principles, having a growing plant, a living root, covering the soil, but if you think of it as, you know, what your green plant is doing is it's harvesting that sunlight. So the the sunlight is the best tool in the world as long as it's being used by a living, growing plant, and it's, and it's staying off the soil. And in the middle of the summer, you know, 
when do you get the most sunlight, especially in western New York? We don't get a lot of sunlight sometimes, but when you do get a lot of sunlight is July, June, July, August, September, right? So those are the key times when you really want plants to be growing and harvesting that sunlight. And like Billy said, right now it's amazing how many places are not doing that. Yeah, particularly with the amount of rainfall you guys get. You know, you're not only wasting sunlight, but you're wasting, you know, you're wasting rainfall. And, you know, the soil can only hold so much moisture. And when it's full, then there's only two things that are going to happen to that moisture. It's either it's either going to keep going down through the soil and just percolating deeper, which is taking nutrients with it, or it's going to run off the top and cause erosion and, you know, uh, nutrient loading of your waterways. And so both of those are bad. So you've got... You know, you need to use some of that moisture in that time frame because your soils just physically cannot hold all the moisture that you would get. So you just as well run it through a plant and do good things for the soil. And then the more carbon you put into the soil through plants growing, the more moisture you can hold. And so you can actually uh, dramatically increase how much water you can store. Uh, every additional percent of organic matter is going to give you approximately 25,000 gallons of additional water storage on an acre. And so, you know, if you can, you know, like what Grant Grant has done, you know, when he started there, you know, on that Ozark mountainside, you know, he probably had, you know, one to one and a half percent organic matter. Well, now a lot of his fields are, you know, five and 6%, you know, so he's essentially storing 100,000 gallons of water per acre, more than he could have when he started and more than a lot of his neighbors that have not done any development. It's pretty incredible to go to his fields, do a soil probe, and and it's great, great soil, but you can hardly probe it because there's rocks all over the place because it's literally just literally a bunch of rocks with this great soil right on top. And, yeah, and he's amazing. built it, you know, basically, you know, not from the bottom up, but from the top down. And it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. I think and that's one of the misconceptions we just had this talked about on a show we did a couple weeks ago. We were the five of us were sitting on the deck talking and and we were talking about tilling, and the point came up of, well, we need more water infiltration. It was, I think it was Brian or Brad that said it, and Dallas quickly corrected him and said, well, no, when you turn that ground up, you're opening it up, and that water isn't going to infiltrate the same way it would as if you left yeah. the ground intact and didn't you know, let the organic matter be on top and help that soil be healthier. And that's a misconception I had until I started learning some of these things working with Dallas, that that's really a big reason why we're trying not to till the ground is to yeah. is to help it so that we can absorb some of that water. Yeah, the two the two places where a lot of tillage is done, number one is in farming because farmers think that's going to help get water into the soil. The other one is in construction and road building and they're doing significant tillage because they're trying to keep anything from entering that soil. So, one of those two people are wrong and I don't <laughs> think probably you guys doing foundations and roads. Interesting. Yeah. The um it, but it's funny because the farmers here are doing it for both reasons. So that's that's where it's funny because in the spring they're all they're all out there in April way before they're going to put corn in the ground and they're all out there disking up their fields and they're doing that to let the water out. I'm assuming because you can see the fields dry out as soon as they do that. So I can understand why that's one point where they we do get a lot of moisture here. So it's tough for guys to get their fields dried out in the spring and it does it does seem to accelerate that drying time because when it's 45 degrees out here but sunny in a in a mid-april day and you can get on the field and work it up a little bit and let that moisture out it does dry their fields up nicely but then it'll sit there fallow for another three weeks too so i, I guess i don't follow yeah. that but you can see that they're doing it because of trying to get their soil dried out so they know that that it's going to happen but yet they they may or may not understand that it's going to adversely affect them right after they get their crop in the ground. Sure. Yeah, you're letting water out. You're also letting a lot of the carbon out. You know, right. you're you're basically oxidizing the carbon, and you know it's it's disappearing as CO two. Um, but you know, think about it. If if you get a if you're if you're out out back wherever and it rains and you need to get home, are you going to drive your pickup or your four-wheeler? Are you going to drive it through that tilled field? Or are you going to drive through the pasture right next to it that has green living growing plants and it kind of has that sod? Well, I mean, the, the answer there is obvious. You're going to drive on the sod because even though they're both wet 
and both have are holding water, <clears throat> the the sod, the living root system will hold you up. And so we've got a growing number of farmers discovering that if they can have that cover crop growing there, that root structure not only is using up some of that moisture to, to, to offset the uh, the fact that it might be too wet, but it also gives a lot of holding capacity of holding your equipment up. Now, the one thing that is a problem in northern climates is that we'll keep that cooler as well because that tilled soil, you know, black is going to absorb sunlight and it's going to tend to heat up. Uh, so it will keep that soil typically cooler. So there's, you know, there's trade-offs back and forth and, you know, we could talk the whole time probably just about that, but it does kind of morph into the second soil health principle that I want to talk about. And that, that is minimizing soil disturbance. We've talked a lot about tillage and it certainly is a destructive process. You know, in nature, the only tillage that you see in a natural system is, you know, through some sort of a catastrophe, whether it be a, you know, an earthquake or, you know, some sort of catastrophic event, you know, as far as widespread severe tillage. Now, there is a tremendous amount of tillage going on in really good natural native soils through earthworms. And they're doing that tillage through their burrows, but they're, they're actually building soil structure instead of degrading it because they're, they're doing very precise. It, it's almost like a precision tillage and it's, it's up and down and, and they leave those burrows that are great for helping get water into the soil. But I think everybody understands tillage and, you know, a lot of what it, the destructive things, you know, it's, it's destroying those, those earthworm channels. And so it, it really, not only does it really slow down your water infiltration, but it also uh, slows down oxygen being able to get down into your soil. You can have the deepest, darkest, blackest soil possible. You can have all kinds of moisture in there, but your roots, your roots need two things to grow. They need water, but they also need oxygen. And so Roots will never grow deeper than the deepest level that oxygen can get to. <clears throat> and so if you have restrictive layers or you have areas where you're just not getting that air exchange between the oxygen and the atmosphere and your soil, you're going to be limited on how deep your roots can grow. And so that's, that's another destructive thing that tillage does is it limits that oxygen la layer because you're, you're basically you're taking all the pore space out of your soil that's what tillage does is it collapses the pore spaces and, and that's why it can't hold as much water, but it also can't hold as much oxygen. And so both are going to really limit uh, how deep those roots can go. So those are, you know, those are a couple things. And then probably a third destructive thing that tillage uh, does is it really disrupts the biology, particularly the fungal uh, pathways, the fungal network. So bacteria, there, there's, there's two primary things in the biological world that we look at in soil. There's, there's more than that, but the ones that get talked about the most are, are bacteria, which are dominant. They can reproduce themselves very quickly. They're teeny, teeny, tiny. And so tillage does not necessarily disrupt bacteria a lot because they're so small and they can reproduce themselves very, very, very quickly. But the fungus, the fungal parts, particularly mycorrhiza fungi, uh, they, they are not able to reproduce nearly as quickly, and they're not small. You know, they say that the largest living organism in the world is not the blue whale. It's not an elephant. It's, it's, a, it's a fungus growing up in a forest in the Pacific Northwest, and this one, and, and they've somehow done experiments to know that it's all one organism, but it covers thousands of acres. That's how big it is. Hmm. Because these, these, these fungal uh communities can can grow from one plant to the next plant to the next plant and it basically just builds this like a giant spider web under the soil and then when you do tillage just think about what you would do to a spider web if you're in a disc through it you're chopping that up into a whole bunch of little pieces really really disrupting what it's trying to do and so that tillage can be destructive that way but i don't want to let the no-till guys off the hook you know by thinking that no-till is the only answer it, it is part of the answer, but when you just substitute tillage for a whole bunch of chemicals and a whole bunch of synthetic fertilizers, you're substituting one disturbance for another. And so, you know, the excessive use of herbicides, excessive use of fungicides, insecticides, and all these pesticides, they're all going to be 
biological disturbances within your soil, which can be just as destructive as the physical disturbance of tillage. So, I mean, ideally, you know, the, the holy grail of soil health is to be both no-till and no chemicals. And that's really, really hard to do. That's why there's not very many people doing it. There's actually some guys really making a go of it that we call it organic no-till to where they don't do any tillage and they don't use any chemicals. They don't use any synthetic fertilizers. In some years, it works pretty good for them. In other years, they, they have some failures. Uh, it's really, really difficult. It's really hard to do. But it's largely the, the system that Grant is promoting uh, through the release process of you know, no tillage and very little chemicals. Now, he will still use some chemicals if he needs to. And, and you can use tillage. It, all of these things are tools. Yeah. They're, they're tools to be used, but you have to use them appropriately. I mean, if you're trying to, you know, build a house and the only tool you had is a hammer, you know, then you'll get some jobs done, but you'll make a mess out of the rest of it. You know, if you're trying to cut a board and you're just using a hammer, you can get it done eventually, <laughs> right. but it's going to be pretty jagged. Yeah. So I don't like it when people think that that's the only tool they have. It's a tool. Use it when you need to, but just know that there's going to be a cost associated with it, and then try to do things after using that tool that will help the soil recover. There was an article that was brought to my attention recently, and I had seen the headline as well, and I'll admit that I didn't open it up and read it, but I told the guy that pointed it out to me, I told him what I assumed that it said in there was, the headline was something like, is no-till really better than tillage or something like that? And I'm assuming that the study was based on farmers that were no-tilling, but they weren't using cover crops or any of the other soil health principles. So people have been led to believe that just no-till alone is going to help their system, but it's it's really not because it, it's just it lacks so many of the other things that are necessary for, for that to be a healthy ecosystem that it, in the end you're probably not much further ahead. I would argue that you're probably still a little bit further ahead, but but not much. Yeah. And I think the key word that you said there is system. You know, we need, we need to be thinking of it as a system and not just, I've got this crop growing here this year. Well, how does that crop affect what I'm going to do next year and two years down the road? And how does what I did two years ago going to affect this crop? And so unfortunately a lot of us as farmers and I, I'm one and we're guilty of this sometimes too, you know, we're pretty short-sighted. We can only see what's in front of us, and we don't consider the, the bigger effects of how it will affect the future and what is the history there. Again, part of that goes back to the context of, of what have I done and where, what do I want to do. But a lot of it just simply has to do with the fact that we have been trained, uh, whether through our schooling or through experience or this is what dad's always done kind of a thing, we've been trained to not necessarily think in as a system, but more as components. Uh, I think they call it reductionist science. You know, when you reduce this huge complex thing down to the little variables, and I'm going to just change this one little thing and see what happens. Well, you know, nature doesn't work that way. You can't, you can't isolate a variable in nature. You can do it in a lab. Very difficult to do in nature because you got so many other environmental factors that are influencing it. You can change or tweak one thing and get a different outcome, but you don't really know if it was that one thing that did that or if it was these other things that weren't the same as what you observed last year. And so, so I think I think the key word there is system. We need to start thinking in systems. And, and so as we think about systems, you know, one of the biggest things that are – agricultural system is missing as compared to nature, how God created, you know, uh, nature to work together. It's, it's biodiversity. And, and, you know, you're starting to hear that more and more. And so that's that third principle of soil health is we want to maximize the amount of biodiversity that we can bring into our system. And again, in a farming situation, it's not very practical to grow 12 things out there at the same time and try to harvest them and have something that I can sell. Now, at some point, you know, we do have people that are growing two things and three things together. They're harvesting the grain all together and then separating it out and selling it as individual products. I think we're going to continue to see that grow as we get, as, as color sorting technology gets better, as, as some of these things not only get better but less expensive. We're going to see more and more people growing multiple crops together and separating them 
some huge benefits agronomically, weed control wise, but also in the quality of the product that, that they're producing. They're finding that when you grow these things in conjunction with each other, far less disease pressure, you have better nutrient density in the different grains. And so I think we'll see more and more of that. Now, for the cattle guys and for the food plotters, we're not trying to harvest grain, which is great because then it allows us to grow all these plants together and have this biodiversity. And what really, really bothers me is when people want to plant a cover crop and they're doing it in the summer. Uh, Dallas, like what you said, you know, after, after wheat, perfect time to do it. And then they only want to plant sorghum sanan, or they only want to plant millet, or they only want to plant soybeans. It's like, there's 20 different things that you could use. Let's, let's pick at least eight or 10 of them because we're going to get benefits from having that biological diversity. Because when we can get the biological diversity above the ground with all these different plants, and, and really what we're looking for is not necessarily the number of plants but it's the number of different plant families that we have represented because each of those plant families is going to do significantly different things in the soil. Uh, the, the root exudates that they're putting into the soil, the biological communities that they host and recruit and promote are going to be distinctly different. And so when we have multiple families, we can have huge benefits to the biology of the soil. So all the legumes are one plant family. All the grasses are one plant family. And all the brassicas, radishes, turnips, mustard, collards, rapeseed, kale, all those, that's one plant family. So all of those things are only three plant families. But when we get into the broad leaves, now we get a lot of different plant families. So sunflowers is different than flax, and phacelia is different than both of those, and sugar beets is a whole nother plant family. So we can really start to introduce a lot of diversity when we start putting in some of those broadleaf plants to complement the grasses and the legumes and the brassicas, which, which are widely used. That's still going to be the majority of our growth and biomass, but we bring a lot of diversity in when we have those. And so when we have those above ground diversity, we've got a diversity of root systems under the soil surface. And, and very importantly, we'll have a diversity of the root exudates that are being pumped out into the soil by these different plants. And, and like I say, that's, that's just going to promote, recruit, and support a very wide, biologically diverse community. And then the other thing that you'll see, and you guys have seen this when you've done these diverse mixes, you'll see incredible diversity of insect and bird life above the ground as well. And I love walking out into some of these diverse fields and just standing still and listening. And you can hear the bees and you can hear the wasps, but you can just hear the buzzing, you can hear the birds chirping. If you walk into into an agricultural field and you are quiet and you hear nothing, that's a bad sign. That's that's a sign of, of, of death and not life. And so, you know, we want to promote as much of that diversity as possible, whether it's, you know, the plants, the insects, the roots, the biology, or the root exudates, you know, that the, the diversity is just going to be really good for the soil. So, again, curious to see how you guys have kind of seen that played out in your area. Nobody's growing, nobody's inter- relay cropping or intercropping or anything as far as I know that I've seen, but I can tell you from from experience in our food plots, I mean, a lot of the things that you're saying there, um, I, I always harp on diversity, but I'm on this podcast, but I, but I think some people think that diversity is four different kinds of clover and chicory or whatever, you know, yeah. or, you know, different, different, uh, brands of corn or whatever, you know, but the, the, what I've, what I've done, what I took from Grant was the four different plant families and then trying to have multiple different species from each different plant family all growing together. And that's what my food plots all are. And what you said about the insects is, is totally true. I mean, you walk into, you know, you walk out, it's, it's getting a little bit less now as some of the plants are starting to mature and we're just starting to put some of the fall crops in. But a month ago you walked out in our food plots and the buckwheat and the sunflowers and the, uh, the cow peas and soybeans and everything working together. I mean, it, as you, you said it, I mean, you stand there and be quiet and you just hear buzzing going on around you. I mean, the, the bees, the, the millions of bees that are in a quarter acre food plot, the grasshoppers, 
Uh, one thing that we've really noticed is that the turkeys really like our turkeys, food plots yeah. this year better. And we, we have a somewhat limited turkey population around here. And uh, they used to be really good, but as as everywhere in the country, it's, turkeys are struggling with habitat. But the turkeys are loving it because they've got this whole ecosystem of, like, you know, 12 to 36-inch tall plants that they're walking around in, and they can still see the ground and have, you know, not be totally covered up. But I think they're just eating grasshoppers all day long. It's just full of bugs, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the the grasshoppers and the bees and and all the other insects that are out there. And that's another misconception of insects. Like, you know, you go out in your garden, you got Japanese beetles and all this other crap eating your plants, right? But people don't... I don't think we hear enough about beneficial insects, the the insects that you actually want in your in your fields. Yeah, that's been that's been one of the fun things for me to watch over the last so like last summer was when we really got going and you had the the summer release blend and especially in we have a food plot we call the garden that is it used to be old pasture and last year we converted it from old it was a pasture then grew up into goldenrod and different grasses and we converted that over into a food plot and really more than anything right now like it's not that we want the deer feeding there but we just want something productive and growing in that area to kind of build the soil health but it's been amazing to watch how well that's grown but then to see all the different things that are using it and to his point of the turkeys is incredible I swear I mean we've been running the Cuddy Link camera system for a few years now and we've got well it's three years we've been running it and so we've got 10 cameras going at all times, 12 months out of the year. And it seems like the volume of deer that we're holding, I mean, we're getting pictures nonstop all day long, like middle of the day, deer are just out doing their thing. And we're just, it just seems that there's more activity on the property than what we had seen in, in two, two and a half, three years ago yeah. before we got going with doing this. So it just seems like the life on the farm is thriving with all this stuff that we're doing. Yeah, what wildlife definitely knows how to vote for what they like because mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. they're going to vote by showing up. And and when you start doing these things, when you start getting back to the again, it's the it's the principles of how God created things to work together. He didn't create plants to grow in monocultures. They don't they don't thrive there without lots of extra inputs. They thrive in these diverse communities, just just like people do, you know. We, we do so much better when we have diversity of people around us, whether it be, you know, different backgrounds or different talents. Uh, there's just there's just great power in diversity because now I don't have to do everything myself. I've got lots of other people I can surround myself with that can do some of the jobs that I'm just not very good at or frankly don't like to do, but other people may. And, and it's kind of the same thing in the plant world. Certain plants have different niches that they fill and that they do well. And when we can bring all those together, plants will cooperate really quite well. In fact, probably better than most people do, actually. Uh, plants will cooperate and, and share the resources, and they almost always look better in mixes than they do when planted by themselves. So the, the, the fourth principle of soil health, or that fourth agronomic principle, is, is to keep living roots as growing as often as possible. And obviously, in order to have living roots, you have to have a green growing plant. And so, you know, that principle is just simply keep something growing there. You know, people have this fallacy that the best thing for the soil is just to let it rest. You probably heard that, you know, and even even in the Bible, you know, they talk about the Jubilee year where you're supposed to let the soil rest. And, And people think that the best way to let the soil rest is to not let anything grow in it. And, and that's the worst thing possible. Yeah. The best way to let your soil rest and recover is to let lots of diversity grow and then not harvest anything and take it away. That's, that's, that's the part where you're not letting the land rest is when you're exporting all the nutrients that it's cycled and that it's produced and you're exporting all that biomass, all that carbon, whether it's in a truck or in a hay bale, that's when your land doesn't rest. But if your land is bare and there's nothing growing, I promise you it's not resting. It's, it is, it is miserable. And it's, you know, soil was never created to be bare, uncovered and with nothing growing in it. Uh, it cannot exist in its, you know, without that, it's just, it's just dirt. You know, there's, there's kind of a saying out there that, you know, uh, soil without biology, it's, it's just geology. 
you know, it's just, it's just rocks and minerals, but you've got to have the biology to actually turn it from dirt to soil. And so this principle, just keep those living roots as often as possible. And again, this is very difficult to do as well. It should be your goal. You're not always going to accomplish it, especially in the drier areas. You just have to uh, accept that fact, but it should be your goal. And again, it, it says as often as possible. So when you're, you know, zero degrees, there's nothing growing. Okay. It's okay. Uh, if you don't have actively growing plants when it's zero degrees, however, if you plant a crop like cereal rye, you plant cereal rye, it's an incredible plant. It will germinate in 34 degree soils. Nothing else does that. So it'll, you can plant it in December and if it's 34 degrees or better in your soil, which it likely will be still in December, that plant is going to sprout. And if you can get a little growth on it, as long as it's above 38 degrees and the sun is shining, that plant is actually going to photosynthesize. Huh. And think about even in these cold climates, think about how often you have days that are above 38 and the sun shines. Well, yeah, you can get some, some little bit of growth. You'll get some photosynthesis. It's not going to be a lot. You're not going to be able to go out there and measure how fast it's growing. But the thing that you'll notice is that rye plant stays green all winter long, whereas wheat and all, most of these other cereals, when they go dormant, it's a hard brown dormant. And it can be 50 degrees in the sunshine. And if that plant is brown, there's no chlorophyll in those cells anymore, it's not going to be doing anything. So even when you're in those really off seasons and you think not much is happening, uh, there's plants like cereal rye and hairy vetch and some of these really cold tolerant clovers that can overwinter, can survive those those cold conditions, and then when the conditions are right, they'll take off and start growing. So again, in the in the food plot world, it's much much easier than the agricultural world because again, your goal is not to try to harvest grain; it's to try to produce feed and forage and attraction for deer, you know, deer habitat. And so it's much easier to, to have the diversity and it's much easier to, to take it from one crop to another. You know, for most crops, and, and again, most people don't realize this, for most crops, it takes about 50% of the moisture that that plant is going to need to get from the plant stage to where it starts reproduction, where it starts to put on a head or put on an ear, whatever it's going to do to try to make that seed. And then the other 50% of the moisture that it needs is basically to take it from that stage all the way out to dry grain. And a lot of times people don't have the moisture to do that, to take it all the way out to a grain crop. But oftentimes you have that first half of the moisture that you need to grow the plant, grow the vegetatively. And so uh, we can get by in, in either where guys are largely livestock and grazing based or the food plot base where we're just trying to grow vegetation and not grain much, much easier, much, much easier to do uh, than to try to take it out to grain harvest. So uh, again, with grant system, with what we are using with a lot of our livestock guys, you know, we may be planting at a minimum twice a year, you know, planting something that's going to grow in the warm part of the year and then planting something that will grow more in the cool season. As you get south, you know, our customers down in, you know, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, they need to really plant three times a year because otherwise they have such a long, warm part of their growing season that one planting of a warm season thing, it's, it's just going to go to seed. It's going to get to full maturity and then it's going to die off and nothing will be there. So they may have to plant three times a year to really do this right, to follow this principle of soil health of keeping living roots out there as often as possible. And, you know, we've talked a lot about this, but you will not ever build your soil if you don't have plants growing out there. It's the only way that soil gets built. Yeah, you can, you know, the, the weathering of rock will build you an inch of soil every 10,000 years or whatever. <laughs> Most people aren't patient enough to wait 30 seconds for the microwave to heat up their burrito, let alone wait 10,000 years for an inch of topsoil. But with a really good diverse system, you can you can literally grow half an inch to an inch of soil a year by following these principles and, and keeping those plants living and growing out there as often as possible. Yeah, that's that's the Grant Wood story there again. I mean what you touched on it before, but what he's done out there is truly amazing and that's um 
you know, the proving grounds as he, as he calls it. He's proving that you can take one of the worst environments in the world and turn it into good soil and good deer hunting. Well, better than good, you know, I mean, because like you were mentioning runoff before, like he, not only is his, is his property entirely made up of rocks, but it's also on a side of a mountain too. So, I mean, to be able to infiltrate and hold water in that system and build organic matter at a pretty rapid rate and build topsoil on top of rocks, he's using all the principles that show you that this, that this works, you know, that this is the way to do it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, he's, he's, uh, the, the Ward Labs, a big soil testing lab, they're actually right here in our backyard here in Nebraska, but they've been out to his place a couple times and pulled a bunch of soil samples. And, and yeah, they're, they're just pretty amazed at how can this literally pile of rocks have this good of soil? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's a great testimony to the power of diversity, the power of a plant. And the power of tenacity, because Grant didn't get there overnight. He's been he's been working at it for a while too, and he'll be the first to tell you that it's not going to be, you know, uh, an overnight success. Yeah, it's an overnight success that was twenty years in the making. Yeah, you know, I guess you might say, for sure. But, you but know, I... when you follow the principles, and then you know, the last principle is is the integration of livestock, and of course, you know, in the food plot world, that's that's the whole goal is we want to integrate deer we want to integrate these animals to come in and by like i said before you know they they will vote by their presence and if they like what you've got they're going to show up and they're going to be there but if they're if you they like what your neighbor has better you're not going to see them and so the whole goal is to provide a, an environment a habitat an ecosystem that is going to attract them and attract them at the right times and and uh, you know a lot of people are having a lot of success doing that with these diverse mixes. You know, in the farming area, it's a little more difficult to integrate that livestock, um, particularly if someone is mostly a crop farmer. You know, they may have to find somebody that has cattle. Or sometimes, you know, you just don't have livestock integrated into the land. And what you see is you still can accomplish lots of things, but properly integrated livestock will accelerate the process mostly because all of the, the biology, the microbes in, in a cattle, in a cow's rumen, uh, when that gets excreted out onto the soil, it gives a huge boost to soil biology. And so you're missing that when you don't have that livestock integration. Now you can, you can uh, kind of tweak that a little bit by applying manure or some of these compost extracts. We can introduce some of that same biology through those methods but again, you know, God created this amazing biological fermentation vat called the rumen, you know, in these ruminant animals, and it's pretty incredible what it does. And it's, and it's actually not the animal that's doing the digesting of, of all that grass and that high cellulose things. It's all of the biology. It's the microbes that are living in the rumen that's actually doing the work. And so it's pretty incredible when you look at the, the similarities between the rumen and what's going on in the soil, and even even our gut biome. There's lots of good research coming out now about how important our gut biome is and how similar that is to what's going on in the soil. Yeah, and I so I've got a question that kind of goes along with this here. That uh, So on, I don't know if you can see them on your end, uh, Keith, but uh, the listeners can actually chime in and, and ask questions and stuff. So... Ben, Ben Williams, Benjamin, as he's listed here, but Ben Williams is a, he's a good friend of ours. He's a land manager, has a, a habitat consulting company called Old Tin Cup. And uh, he's, he's got a question for you and he's wondering about um, starting a food plot program into an old field um, that has no agriculture for 50 plus years at times with, you know, that field might have now golden rod and grasses. He wants to know your thoughts. Would you recommend um, or steer against initial soil disturbance or tillage before planting initially into that old field? Yeah, that's a great question, Ben. And, you know, it's a question that farmers struggle with, too, because if we want to come out of a perennial system and get back into an annual cropping situation, how do you best do that? Because that's essentially what you're talking about is you've got perennials out there and you want to convert to start growing more annuals. Really difficult to do. Now, remember, I said that tillage and herbicides 
are tools. And so you're probably going to have to use a tool. It's going to be up to you to decide which of those tools that you use. But I can tell you this, if you don't use a tool to help yourself through that situation, the chances of you getting annuals established into those uh, firmly established perennials is pretty low. Uh, you know, when it comes to allocation of resources, he who has the deepest roots is always going to win. And that's not going to be the annuals that you're trying to plant. That's going to be the perennials that are already there. Mm -hmm. So you might have to do a little bit of light tillage. You may have to use a little bit of, uh, you know, a burn down chemical. You don't have to completely kill the perennials, but man, you better, you need to get them knocked in the head enough to really set them back to where those annuals have a really good chance of taking off and going. And you'll want to do the timing, if you can do the timing to when the perennials are in their least aggressive growth, and so you have to identify if you have warm season or cool season perennials, try to hit it when they're at their most vulnerable to not wanting to grow, and then use annuals that are best suited to that. So if you have cool season perennials, you'd want to come in in July when it's hotter than blazes, and those cool season perennials want to go dormant anyway. And then plant, you know, cowpeas and sorghum and millet and buckwheat and sunflowers that, that like the heat and will grow very, very rapidly. Or if you have warm season perennials, you do the opposite. You wait till the fall when those warm season perennials are going dormant and then plant cool season things like rye and vetch and clovers and alfalfa and things like that that you can establish in that time frame. So you might be able to do that without any tools tillage or herbicides, but a little bit applied at the right time or used at the right time. Uh, again, it's a tool. Use it. Use it appropriately. Now, I've got a, a question. I appreciate you answering that, and I, I think that probably was great for Ben, uh, your perspective on that. The We've got a, a – so we've got the farm dairy ag land here where we're doing a lot of our stuff, but what a lot of our listeners, and including myself, our family property is – it's down in the Finger Lakes region, which is very hilly, uh, mainly timber, not a lot of ag. And we've started, you know, on our property over the last 25 years, we've worked on clearing some of these areas in the hardwoods and turning them into food plots. And one of the challenges we're having, we, we've got a, a probably quarter acre food plot right in the middle of the woods. We're having a very hard time getting, getting actual plants established that we want to grow not having the weeds take over and so I was having a discussion back and forth with my dad and my brother last night um, and they're trying to figure out you know what their best approach is there and I'm just curious you know kind of similar like what's your thoughts on that like we're at that point right now we're kind of in that getting ready to plant some sort of a fall release and something that can be growing and in the soil throughout the winter what would you recommend in a situation like that? Well, again, it kind of depends on what the weeds are, but from my experience, the, the, the absolute best thing, not only at overwintering, but also doing spring and early summer weed suppression, cereal rye is hands down the king of, of, of that. Uh, so I would want to have a heavy, heavy shot of cereal rye uh, because it's going to overwinter and it's going to be the first thing growing in the spring. A lot of weeds grow simply because there's no other competition. There's nothing else growing. And so you know, again, your soil wants something growing, it's going to encourage those weeds to grow. There's a lot of mechanisms in the soil where the soil can basically dictate what plants grow by, you know, and it's not the soil so much as the microbes, the, the biology of the soil are dictating what's going to happen. And so if there's, if you've got things growing, then there's not nearly as many signals going out to recruit whatever seeds are out there because because the biology doesn't recognize one seed as a weed and another seed as a crop it just sees seeds and it will try to recruit things to grow because it's essentially their food source uh the the root exudates are and so having something out there to compete and and nothing competes better than cereal rye because like i say it's going to be the first thing to grow in the spring it's going to grow aggressively it's got a very deep root system and a very big accumulation of biomass above the ground probably not as palatable to deer as what you know oats or wheat or some of those things are going to be but from a weed control standpoint uh it's very very difficult to beat and that's that's one of the reasons that that grant and i you know we we rolled out a new food plot mix here just recently he's, he's called it plot release and it's got about three to four times the amount of cereal rye in it that the fall release has 
primarily because we were seeing this issue. Uh, the rye that was in there was overwintering and giving some spring weed control, but it, it, it wasn't at a high enough population. It wasn't thick enough to do what he was wanting to see it do. So that plot release has a much higher inclusion rate of cereal rye. And you can kind of do the same thing. You could take the fall release or you take whatever other blend you have and just add another 20 or 30 pounds of rye to it. Uh, just kind of boost it on the rye side of things. And that will give you the best uh, spring weed control of anything that I know of. Yeah. And we've seen, we've seen with the rye, it's simply also, I mean, it might not be very palatable to the deer, but going back to the point of how we've seen wheat drop off, this is a big conversation Dallas and I have had, but we keeping so much, we had, I think we had a, quite a bit of rye growing this spring on the farm. And there was a, we had a lot of good habitat for fawning and for turkeys for cover where a lot of the other things haven't grown up yet. You don't have leaves on in the woods. So it was a huge benefit to us, I believe, um, to do that. So you getting, you getting close to needing to tap out here. Well, I've got another meeting at 9.15 okay. here, so yeah, we've got another five minutes. Well, I mean, we, we can start to close her out, too. So I think we hit really what we wanted to. We wanted to get those principles out there, and and I am fascinated by the work you're doing, and I'm learning a lot from Dallas physically going out and doing it in the field here. And I think what you're doing um, can be a great resource. We talk a lot about this stuff on the podcast, but you're coming at it from like almost from the scientific back end and giving some really good information on how this stuff works and i'm going to put it in the in the the uh, information the description of the podcast i'll put a couple of the links from the videos that i watched before we we jumped on here today and it's it's quite eye-opening and some of the comparisons you use to the economy and infrastructure of our country and how that is similar to the way that soil works and how our how the environment works is it's fascinating the connections that you draw between those two things and i know we would love to get you back on sometime to kind of further dis- further the discussion because you could go for hours on hours talking about some of this stuff. So yeah, no, I'd be happy to do that. And you know, one of the one of the so you're referencing the carbonomics talk, yes. which has been a very popular, a very useful talk because it, it compares what's going on in the soil to the economy of a country. So it it puts it in the context that people can understand. But another another thing that I uh, kind of rolled out a new talk that I did I actually did it at Grant's place uh, earlier this spring was talking about the concept of biological grace you know grace is you know we're given grace by God it's stuff we don't earn you know we don't deserve it we can't earn it you can't buy it and, and that's largely what we see as we try to grow things you know we've got we've got free sunlight you know we don't buy it you can't earn it you don't deserve it, but everybody has it. You've got, you got sunlight, you've got the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to grow these plants. You know, you've got free nitrogen in the air. There's 30,000 tons of nitrogen above every acre of soil. You've got all of the minerals that your soil is made up of. You've got all the biology that's there to make it all work. And then you, you get, you get water, you get free rain. And so it's not always cons- as consistent as we'd like to be, but we waste a lot of rain anyway. And so, I've got, you know, kind of a talk that lays all those out of how we've got all of these things that God has given us. We've got the things, you know, all of these things that are out there free for the taking. We just need to develop the system that utilizes all of those to make it all work. So, yeah, maybe I can come back on another time and we can talk about that. Yeah, and I'm I'm fascinated because you kind of hinted at it in the carbonomics, but I'm I don't I don't know when did you do that that spe- that talk? When was that? The, the one I just described? Yeah, what that video that I watched, that hour-long carbonomics talk you had. Oh, yeah, I probably have been doing that talk for six years, maybe. Okay. So I'm, I'm very fascinated because in about the carbon aspect and the carbon credits and the trading of that, I that's something I'd love to know um, what you're hearing and what you're seeing on your end. That's something I'd love to jump into on another discussion because that's yeah. something that is very relevant right now, uh, and I've got a friend of mine who's a huge farmer here and uh, I know that's a discussion he's very engaged in um, with his, with the region, you know, talking with farmers and trying to figure out how to commoditize that. So yeah, I'd love to get you back on here. This has been a fantastic conversation. Do you have anything in closing Dallas? No, it's obviously really appreciate you coming on and, you know, taking an hour out of your day for us here. That's his, uh, you know, like, as I said before, this is something that's just, 
it's totally fascinating to us, this whole, it's kind of a new world that's been open to us. So we really enjoy talking about it and really appreciate you having your time today, Keith. Thank you. Okay. Thanks guys. My pleasure. Take Thank care, everybody. Thanks Thank for you. watching. Keep feeding them. See ya. All right. Bye. Bye. Absolutely. Do you want to, well, let's just keep it rolling for a minute. Oh, okay. So he had to go. Sorry. Why don't we, yeah, why don't we just, yeah, you I'm and sure. I can kind of close her out. This will be a little bonus. This won't be on the, uh, won't be on the, the video version, but, um, so what do you think? How, how was that? I think that was a pretty, pretty informative discussion. Absolutely. Yeah. I th it was a very basic discussion. You know, that's where, that's where I thought we should start was just try to get something. These are the, the basics of the basic principles of soil health. I mean, that's truly, that's, that's what it is. And that's, that's your, um, you know, you're kind of your base to build, build off of. I think it's just a, it's a topic that's going to be keep coming more relevant over the years. I mean, there's, there's, uh, it's so much wider than what we were just talking about. It's not just for farmers and food plotters to, to become more profitable, but it's really, we didn't even touch on the environmental side no. of things today where it, that's, that's that's really where this is going to lead, and I think where where farmers are going to be pushed in a direction where they're going to have to start be farming regeneratively. I'm pretty sure the government's going to come in and take away their tools here before long and start regulating more of what they do. Right, and obviously that's something that we're against. We we don't like that. I agree. <clears throat> but if we can, if farmers can start doing more of this, these things on their own before, you know, the government has to come in and start saying you you can't till anymore you can't just randomly put down as much fertilizer as you want Correct. anymore you're you're affecting the waterways you're affecting the environment you're you know why do we have droughts in the midwest that last half the summer well, a lot of it's because of the farming practices i gotta go pp but i i love that and i hold on a second bye -bye. hold on so like that's the those are the light bulbs that started going off in my head yesterday when I was watching that video. And I started thinking about like all the different things that are happening worldwide. Yeah. Not just here. You see what's going on over in, in Holland with them cutting back on nitrogen and fertilizer and shutting some of these plants down. And the farmers are essentially like literally protesting yeah. because, and it is a scary thing because right. the way that agriculture is done today, you take those inputs out. Like, we need to feed people. Like, yeah. we can't just overnight change those things. But the amount of of farmers are not doing these things out of the hate for the environment. No. They're trying to do their job, and they're trying to feed people. But there is, there's a lot of these things that, you know, like you talked about, the droughts, the water shortages, all the runoff, the, the loss of, of good soil. You know, he talked about it, and I think it was in his carbonomics. It yeah. might have been in the other video. I don't know. But, like, all of the things that we're doing to the land are impacting all of these downstream things. And, you know, when he was talking earlier in this discussion about he brought up something that made me think about all the issues we're having. Um, I think it was something along, the lines, along the, the lines when we were talking about tillage and how you have the soil and running off and you have all these mineral deposits and all the, the bacteria and all the all the stuff in the soil is getting washed down wherever it might go. You go over in the Finger Lakes, one of the biggest problems we're having in the state over the last 10 to 12 years, maybe even longer, I've just been aware of it, is all these algae blooms that are happening in all the lakes. And it happens every single summer, and it's largely because of runoff of fertilizers that are coming down. Now, it might not even just be fertilizers, that's what I'm thinking, but it could just be all the nutrients, all the stuff in the soil that's just getting blown off in these huge ravines washed off into these lakes and then the lake is getting all this plant food and just exploding. Mm -hmm. So what right? you're seeing is just a smaller version of what's going on in the Gulf of Mexico. Right. There's a giant Plume. dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico where there is no life. Yeah. And what that is is that's just nitrates from upstream. You know, all the waterways in the Midwest feed into the Mississippi River, which runs down into the Gulf of Mexico, which deposits 
uh, nuclear waste, essentially, that, that just make, there's no fish. I mean, nothing can live there. Yeah. Nothing can live there. And it, what it is, is a lot of it, it's, it's nitrates, which is like the byproduct of nitrogen. So nitrogen is good in the soil when the plants can uptake it, which is another reason why you need to have plants growing in the soil at all times is so that they can be using the, ni- the nitrogen in the, that's in a plant available form, as opposed to like Keith said, when you get tons of rain and there's no plants in there, it'll push those nutrients down into the water table and they'll eventually end up in the Gulf of Mexico. So living roots, growing plants, harvesting sun sunlight, this stuff all makes a lot of sense. There was another video I sent you a while ago about desertification, which is a whole other... Oh, that was with that other guy that gave like a talk. The guy from, he was South, from Africa. South Africa yeah. that, uh, that's talking about how the, the deserts can be, you know, the deserts weren't always there. You know, that's just happened from mismanagement of Overuse, land. Overuse, yeah. And when an area becomes a desert, it becomes so arid that we then you can't get rain. Uh, there was a, there's a, I don't know if it was on that talk or another thing that I've watched, but there's places in the Middle East where they're, with the, all over the world, they're doing this in, in experimental fashion, but they're actually greening the deserts. And all they're doing is using livestock. They're not irrigating. Huh. They're just... So what happened is what what that guy was talking about was saying that we thought for years that livestock were ruining, that they were over grazing and, and turning things into a desert because there wasn't enough water to support them. So we took all the livestock off the land, and then we found out that things got much worse after that. We actually need livestock integrated, and that's one of the soil health principles, livestock, right? Mm-hmm. We actually need that in the in the deserts, in the, just all over the landscape, we need livestock. They, (laughs) what was the, uh, this place in the Middle East that I'm talking about, there's, the only places that there's, so, so we still have these population of people who are herding sheep and, and things, that's how they survive, right? Yeah. Third world countries, you know. They're still living they're still living the same life they in were living. In Afghanistan, they're living out in the desert with their sheep. and a thousand years ago. Yeah. yeah. So that's still going on today. So the only place that green plants grow in those places are the washouts because the water runs down in there. They get enough water where plants grow. So the sheep will go up in there and eat those plants. Well, when it does rain, they get a two-inch rain. Well, two inches around here makes mud puddles in the driveway, right? But right. in the desert... It fl- it'll flood out a whole valley. Right. Yeah. And where's all the water go in the valley? Right. Where the sheep are. They lose more sheep and livestock in the deserts due, due to, to flood. flooding. No flooding. shit. Can you imagine that? <laughs> because the wa- because the soil is so ruined that it can't infiltrate any water. Mm-hmm. The water just hits the ground, runs right into those chutes, down the chutes, and kills all the animals that are in it. Yeah. Can you imagine living in a place kills that a lot gets of people too. six inches yeah. of rain a year and you lose all your livestock because of a flood? It's pretty hard to to reconcile. Right. We get six inches of rain in a week sometimes. So they took one of these places and built, just used stone and manual labor, and just they built um, just ways to divert the water and hold the water better. And and they started greening that that runoff, and then it expanded. And soon enough, they had themselves a nice green oasis in, in the desert. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that, like, the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, like, back in ancient, you know, I don't know if that was the Romans or the Greeks or yeah. whatever, but, though, I mean, it was, they, I don't know where I've heard this, or but, it, you know, we all listen to so much shit, but it was, they basically farmed and they just farmed it to death. Right. And the soil just broke down and blew away, and they lost all the soil, and now it's, it's you can't grow anything there. You know? It was one of the biggest downfalls of the Roman Empire was, right. I think was that's soil is, yeah. health right. because they had to keep – the reason they kept expanding and conquering new areas was because they farmed the piss out of their land to the point where it wouldn't produce anymore because you couldn't just go down to the co-op and buy nitrogen. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't buy triple 13 and just put it on your crops back then. Right. They farmed it to the to bad farming practices, led to their soil being depleted to the point where they couldn't feed their people and they were starving, so they had to go and – kill another civilization off and take all their food from them. And then after a while that ran out and they had to go do it again and again. And to the point where they couldn't feed their people and they were, they were themselves became extinct. Sure. Right. I mean, that's life 
food is life. Water is life. If you don't have those things, you don't right. live. So and they, that, that's one of the things you, you said it to me, you know, you and I, talk, have, we have a lot of these, these deep talks about this sort of stuff. And I, and you had said to me months ago, we were talking about something and, and you're like, we're going to fix this. We're going to fix this CO2, you know, carbon greenhouse gas issue. We're going to fix it through regenerative ag. That's how we're going to change things. And you had brought up that you had seen a, you know, a NOAA like time-lapse, you know, of salt, like the, where they're analyzing the, the amount of carbon being released in the atmosphere. Yeah. And there's a, there's a, there's a, an obvious time period when all of the fields across the, especially the, cent, the central part, the Midwest of the country, where the majority of, of like the, you know, the best ag in the country yeah. or the best soil, everything like you see that area just, just exploding carbon yep. out of the ground because they're just turning everything up and releasing that all into the atmosphere. Right. And you know, if there's anything that's going to cause farmers, especially so like we're in a transitional period right now, and we're seeing it here, you know, locally with a lot of the family farms we know is that they're, you know, like happened with our family is, you know, our father, you know, my father-in-law, your dad, they're towards the end of their career, they retire and they sell their farm to a larger farm and the farm that purchased it. I mean, they're incredible what they do, how efficient they are, the equipment they have, and they don't leave much behind. But like, you know, damn well that, that Brad is looking at that and going, look at the cost of all of our inputs right now and all the things we're doing, you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're going to have to start looking at some of these different things. Cause if the price of fertilizer and nitrogen and, and all the things that they use, the uh, pesticides, herbicides, yeah. like they're going to have to. And most of the be, farmers are well aware of these, these problems. They yeah. just don't know how to, they, where uh, do you get started? Yeah. And, and they do like Brad's a good example. I mean, they're very educated people they're they're very aware oh, of no doubt. a lot of the things that that they could be doing better i've had talks with him about this this regenerative stuff but it's just you know there's a lot of challenges and one of those challenges is the way that other people look at you mm-hmm. a lot of people are afraid to try things a lot of farmers are because what other people are going to say about them and i'm not saying that's his issue i really don't think he gives a shit but that is that is really one of the major holdups in trying different farming practices is that you it's a status in the community for your corn to look a certain way for your (laughs) soybeans to look a certain way especially in this town yeah when i drive down the field and i see corn that's not as tall and green as as the other guy's corn i'm wondering what he's doing different now i'm looking at it from a different point of view like thinking well that guy might be smart because he's putting less inputs into that or whatever you know one of the one of the big holdups with farming too is that Everyone's looking at yield, and it's the same thing. I want to pump my chest and say I grew, you know, 220 bushel corn or whatever it is. I'm, I'm, I don't know, whatever is a good number, but you, you know, you want to compare it to everybody else, and you know, people talk. I mean, we know a lot of different. Far- we have several different farms just in our family, right? And then we know a lot of these other people around. And when you're having conversations or you overhear conversations between a couple of farmers, they're like, well, look at Joe down the road there. His <laughs> corn looks like shit this year. <laughs> right. Like that stuff is going on. It's yeah. a real thing. It's It matters. You know, it shouldn't matter. But nobody's looking at Joe's bottom line and saying, well, he made twice the profit that, that you did this year, but, you're, but goddamn, your corn looked a lot nicer than his, right? <laughs> like that's – that's what's going on. That that has a that has an effect on these farming practices. And like I said, there was already just you know you talked about the the fertilizer thing in Holland, but there's New York is is in the process of doing things right now. And it, there's like you look at all these government programs too, like CRP, mm-hmm. waterway projects stuff. Like they're trying to for many years they've been trying to take farm some farmland out of production and put it into more natural systems because of just, you know, they're especially around the waterways. They're trying to limit the pollution and the runoff into the, even the small streams. So they're trying to do this stuff with incentives. But let me be very clear that we know how government works. They'll put the carrot out in front of you for a while, but if you don't eat enough carrots, they're going to shove them down your fucking throat. (laughs) Right, yeah. You're going to choke on them until you die. Yeah. Okay, so (laughs) if you're not doing the things that we're being encouraged to do as far as changing farming practices, 
you're going to wake up one day and be told you got to do it, and then you're going to have to make a decision on how you're going to do it. You're cause you're either going to have to shit or get off the pot, and it may not be in our lifetimes, but it's coming. Yeah. Eventually. Oh, and it could be it could be the next generation. It could be Brad's yeah. kids. It could be Mike's kids. They're going to have to figure out right. this stuff. You know, you're going to be told you're going to have to apply for a permit to to plow your land, to put fertilizer down. You're going to have to show proper soil tests from a from a reputable soil testing lab that shows that you do indeed need to put down enough fertilizer to get a good crop. It, like Keith said, these things are tools. Yeah. They're not all – there's there's nothing that you can just say that that's never going to be a thing that you should do, but I think it's coming to the point where you're eventually – and it may be 20, 30 years from now or 50 years from now, but we're going to get to the point where you're going to have to validate reasons why you need to do these things. And the whole, there's something else I've been hearing recently too. The whole feed the world thing is kind of an exaggeration because we waste billions and billions of pounds of food every year. We're overproducing food. It's just not going to the right places to the people that need it. Right. We're, we're wasting so much food around the world. You know, on one hand, we have millions of people starving to death every year. And on the other hand, we're dumping food. I mean, <laughs> look at my fucking garbage every every week. I mean, we're we're wasting produce and and good locally grown food it's going in the garbage a lot of times you know uh, on top of that our most of our corn and soybeans are going to ethanol and right and byproducts and shit that yeah oil either it's and, not food or yeah. it's or it's corn syrup right shit that we shouldn't be eating anyways <laughs> so yeah we're feeding the world full of garbage yeah yeah shit yeah so don't tell me that we need every acre of corn to feed the world we don't yeah i know and that but like these are a lot of these conversations end up becoming like overly like i've heard a lot of these discussions about everything that's going on right now like around the world and everything that's going on you know with the whole ukraine russia situation and the wheat impacts that that's going to have and other issues around the world you know it's always like it's pulling at your heartstrings or that millions of people are going to die and there's going to be famine and it's like yeah, like how do you not get like emotional and it let your heart kind of guide you on some of that? But yeah, there's just so much waste, and and that's why I feel like, you know, it, it's not really part of this conversation, but it is in a way. Is like trying to keep it local. You know, buy your vegetables from the from the local co-op down the road. Go up to the, go up the road to the to the family that's got the small family farm that right. all they do is they have all throughout the summer they have different vegetables all summer long. You know, buy your stuff locally. Try to eat good healthy foods because all of this process like everything is so processed now and that's why it, you know to your point of so many things getting thrown away and just it's like we're putting i guess it goes back to the conversation of comparing it to your soil inputs and what you're getting out of it okay you so know now, so many people are unhealthy because we're putting processed garbage into our bodies and then you're unhealthy you're at the doctor all the time you got diabetes you got all these things it's like maybe right. it's because of the inputs okay it is because of the inputs but now all right, now we're grinding gears. Oh, yeah, let's grind them. Okay, so you're right about the processed foods and buying it from the store, right? And you're right that buying it locally from a farm is going to be better. But those foods aren't healthy anymore in a lot of cases either because even though you're buying it locally and it's not processed, in most cases they're using bad farming practices to grow those fruit and vegetables that you're buying around here too. Right, good point. Even, even the organic stuff, if you look at what it takes to be an organic farmer, it takes a lot of tillage because they won't they can't use the chemical inputs. So everyone wants to feel good about buying organic, but I have a real issue with organic food. Not in every case, like like Keith said today, there are farms out there that are doing no till organic. And that's really the holy grail of farming, but it's very difficult to do, and especially in vegetable and fruit production, I understand why it can be so hard. But it takes a lot of bad environmental farming practices to produce organic food in general. Not everybody, but you can feel good about the fact that they're not spraying herbicides and pesticides and fungicides on your food. But what they're doing to the soil to get that food to grow is not always good either. Right. They're and those foods don't have a lot of nutrients in them because 
the soil they're they're growing in doesn't have any health to it. Exactly, yeah. and that's that's where we're going. We think that now that this is a lot of the problem with the with health in our. You know, it's not just that we eat bad. It's that when you do go to the store and buy food that should be healthy, they don't have anywhere near the nutrients in this food that we used to. They're saying that, the, the like, you don't get nearly the iron and calcium and the, the critical nutrients that your body needs from these, from vegetables anymore. Mm-hmm. Because of, and it's all because of soil health and farming practices. Because everything is geared towards yield you gotta make you gotta you gotta grow bigger tomatoes more tomatoes you know everything is based and it's and then when you sell it in a grocery store or where, wherever you sell it go to the farmer's market people are going to pick the stuff that looks the nicest right they're gonna the biggest healthiest looking vegetables are usually the ones that had the most inputs <laughs> going into them right. to make them that way they're probably less healthy than yeah you go eat the strawberries from the farm right up the street from the house here and they're like they're this big, yeah. but you bite into them and it's like an explosion of flavor and taste in your mouth. And you go by the ones at tops that are, you know, they're yeah. freaking golf ball golf ball or, size, yeah. and you eat them and it's just like, yeah, there's like nothing to it, you know. Right. So yeah, it, it's all fascinating. But then right. think about so bringing it back to deer, you know, it's the same thing. Like right. we're trying to grow things that are that are feeding them at the highest nutrition level possible because them eating corn. And soybeans as their only primary summer food, that's kind of what it normally is around here. And yeah. alfalfa, triticale, whatever. But like, if we're if we're if we have healthier food plots and fields that we're managing, those deer are eating, trying to feed them the most nutrient dense, right. healthy food, which is going to lead to a healthier deer herd, bigger bucks, hopefully. Yeah, you know. And I think that that's that's like a huge thing, and that's what's been interesting to see as over, you know, it's been a two year or two years from the farm being transitioned over to the, to the, the tillable fields being run by someone else. And we've been doing our own thing. And you really, this is the second full summer of doing that. And it's like, all of a sudden now we've got like all these different deer that we've never seen, or we weren't seeing now that we've got stuff that's like getting to maturity or growing well, since we got that shot of rain, back in the end of July, now it's like we've got all these deer showing up, <laughs> and it's like, why are you here all yeah. of a sudden? Is it, you know, we don't know. I mean, it yeah. could just be because they're passing through, or is it because all of a sudden we've got all this food that's providing them with all this nutrition, and they want to hang out, Yeah, come to dinner table. Right, and I think the the longer we go with zero, in, you know, limited inputs, you know, the, my next my next project is to, to cut back drastically on the uh, – the roundup i realized that we're using more of that than i want to but it's as keith said it's a tool and you have to you somehow you need to get a somewhat successful crop right but we need to really use the the winter the cool season annual covers like the rye and the wheat to suppress weeds and uh and to be able to help us limit the herbicide use and the cost of that of course too but I think in the end we'll find that not having Dad just slam in three acres of corn and soybeans for our food plots is is probably going to be the best thing that happens to us in terms of at least the f- the food. You know, yeah. There's so much other habitat work to work on, but yeah, um, you know, he Keith mentioned it three times today that deer will they will tell you, and I think it won't happen right away either. It takes deer a while to learn where these these foods are, but when they come into your food plot and there's there's 13 different plants growing and they can pick, they, they call them concentrate selectors. So deer can somehow know they're not the only animals The cattle do it too, but they know the healthiest nutrient rich plants and they're able to select them. I don't know how, if it's, if it's smell, if it's sight, if it's taste, you know, maybe they just sample some things and they can, but somehow their bodies can tell what the most nutrient rich healthy plants are and they go and pick them they select them mm-hmm. so if you give them all those options to choose from instead of just a, a monoculture of whatever i mean a monoculture of soybeans works good they, like 
that is, he said there's no magic bean, and I was going to be like, I don't know, have you planted <laughs> soybeans? Because they're kind of magical. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, <laughs> like, that's the closest thing you can get to. And then, of course, after they make grain, you know, whether it be it soybeans or corn, you know, the grain deer really select. But that's also because it's in the winter when they don't have anything else to choose from. They can eat the ends of, of sticks, or they can go and eat corn on the cob. Right. So, obviously, <laughs> they're pretty happy eating that corn then. But the the diversity in the food plots is is going to be a big deal for those deer and and you know when they're out there recreating in there that's our that's our livestock it's not as good as having cattle out there where you know if you fence one of our 2 acre food plots and put cattle out there for a few days and they go and trample the whole thing and eat half the food on there because you'd want to get them out of there before they ate everything you want to keep something growing right but uh having if you had 10 or 20 cows out there you know pissing and shitting all over the place so you know they'd be eating everything up running it through their room and stomach and shit it back out the other end that that's the ultimate you know so we don't have quite that maybe we need to buy some cattle in the future there's plenty of people around that would probably pay us to run cattle on our food plots but there's a lot of you know, you'd have to fence it and water it and all that kind of stuff. It's the so, future, Dallas. we yeah. got to find out ways to figure make make some money on this property. Yeah. I mean, there's different ways that we've talked about, but it's just, it's just, a, there's this, this conversation just goes a million different directions and every, and every one of them is fascinating. And back, back to the environmental, the climate change thing, you know, we didn't say climate change before, but we could all get our heads around climate change a little easier and, and accept it. The reason why, uh, okay, some people just don't believe it's happening and that's fine. Maybe, maybe it's just a cycle we're in or whatever, but most reasonable people, even on the side of things that we're on, usually will admit that the climate's changing for the negative and it's human impacted. What we have a p- struggle with is the solutions that are being proposed that are so stupid, you know, Mm -hmm. they want to just, you know, the left wants to cut out all of the, um, fossil fuels, fossil fuels, carbon emitting fuels. Right. But they want to do it in a way that just, you know, well, we're going to do it with wind and solar and, and electric cars and all this shit that it's like, yeah, okay, that stuff can help. You know, that should be part of the plan. Part of the mix. Yeah. Um, diversity, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. But what's wrong with nuclear? That's the best, cleanest type of energy. Yeah. You know, but really, I honestly, a lot of smart people think that the whole climate could be rectified just by farming and ranching practices, just better farming practices, and also with the like the desertification thing. Like we need to, we need to get. It would obviously, it would take time, but, you know, these deserts, I don't care how many windmills you put up, the deserts aren't going to turn green again. We need to integrate human interaction and and animals and livestock into these things to try to to fix some of these other problems. But just putting up windmills isn't going to fix the environment. And that's, I'm, this whole, the climate change topic is something, and like, that's where... It's ama- it's interesting to me how my how the interests in my life like continue to evolve and change. Deer hunting is like always it's the core of like everything, yeah. but like all these whether my career, you know, the politics, all these things that I take interest in and then it all kind of comes together in these similar issues, you know, they're all wrapped around the the environment that we live in. Yeah. And we're passionate about the environment like i don't want this earth to go to shit no. you don't want this earth i want all the things my, i want the people i know the animals i love the uh, the the mountains that i that i adore i want that stuff to stay wild and stay good right but like the 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 thoughts that that we can change mother nature and all the things in the globe and the world and the earth we can change all that by by forcing people to stop using a fossil fuel and yeah. that's going to solve our problems. Like I, so I'm reading this book right now that is fascinating. And I've heard this guy talk and he's done a ton of podcasts. His name is Alex Epstein. And the, the book is called fossil future. And he's, he's, I'm about 
150 pages in, like five chapters in. It's a it's a long book, but his uh, and I only get like I only read at night, and I read for like five minutes, and then I'm ready to fall asleep. asleep. <laughs> so, but I'm but it's a really really fascinating book, and I want to I want to physically read it because I've heard him talk, and I know the premise of what he's getting at, but the actual data behind it is that there are the the long and the short of it is that human civilization is flourishing more today than it ever has. And we have far less climate disaster related deaths, like heat, yeah. cold, natural disasters. We have far less deaths, like dramatically, like 99% less deaths and, than we did. And far more people die from cold every year than they do heat. 100%. You know, that's right. one of the alarmism things is talking about how people in the South are dying from, from, um, from heat. Mm-hmm. First of all, Get a goddamn air conditioner, right? Okay, but so 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 the cold right. is killing more so people. So the the point is that the there's a direct correlation. The point of the book I'm at right now, there's a direct correlation in the last two thousand years. I think is what he's looking at. The last thousand years, but let's just say the last two thousand years. So basically, since you know, since time was created, whatever, in looking at these things, that when fossil fuels were were adopted. All of everything, the production of everything, GDP, life, uh, life expectancy, people are living longer. Everything is doing better since fossil fuels are introduced. Mm-hmm. But the, we we are seeing this climate yeah. change right now. It's a bi- it's you, a go, byproduct. Go, you go back to 1970, all the same people that were pounding on the drum saying the world's going to come to an end because of climate were saying it was going to happen because of cold, not because of heat. Yeah. And now <laughs> we're going the other. So it's like. Yeah. So instead of everybody getting emotionally wound up about this, let's look at what's working today. And we have, so like he divides this whole thought up into two different, really two different main groups. People that are all about wanting to, they have like a nourishment, like an environmental nourishment. Like the environment is the thing that we need to make the best, not humans. It's an anti-human narrative. Yeah. Whereas the other is where I think a lot of like you and I are coming from is that we need to continue to do what's best for our families, for people, for humans, human flourishment. If humans flourish, we can do great things to help the environment and we continue to keep this whole thing going in the right direction. But if, I mean, it's clearly an an anti, we are gifted and blessed to live in the country and to have the things that we have here in the U S we are, we have it better than we will ever know because I'm not going over to some mountain in Afghanistan to see these people that are literally living in a hole in the ground. I'm not going to do that because that like I'm I don't want to. Yeah. But we are like on this almighty horse over here. I know. Thinking that we have everything that we can fix all the world's problems. It's like there's still people that don't even have electricity and they're not going to get electricity from a wind turbine. They're going to get it from maybe a small modular reactor, nuclear reactor, or maybe natural gas power plant. Like we have to be realistic about the world and the globe and where these things are going. Well, and it, you know, if we reduce our fossil fuel use, China's not going to do that. Russia's not going to do that. No, you know, and they're the they're the main contributors to this stuff. So, you know, just bringing it back to our conversation is just like with the uh, the carbon dioxide map. You know, like we we know there's things we can that are bad for the environment that we're doing that we can easily rectify and do better without having to go to extreme measures, you know, the extremism is what drives everybody crazy. Yeah. You know, from both perspectives of things. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. The, the climate change isn't a thing argument is, is not a good argument no. because you can't, there's no change is inevitable. Yeah. Change one way or the other. And the world is going to end in 12 years. Argument is no good either. No, so, no. Because if we only got 12 years left, fuck it. If I am, I'm going I'm to go get some <laughs> cocaine and hookers. What yeah. I, do? I mean, I think that argument's like 75 years old now about, <laughs> you know, that, that Probably the older world's going to end in 12 years. So right. there's somebody j- I just heard say recently that humans are bad at preventing, but great at adapting. Mm-hmm. That's how we got to where we are in this civilization is adapting. You know, as you said, yeah. you looked back through the all the the problems we've had historically. We had this conversation the other night with COVID and CWD. We will adapt. We will prevail. But that that's what we do is adapt. We're bad at preventing because no one can ever Agreed agree of. on how we're going to prevent things. But when faced with a problem, a real problem, not some fucking pie in the sky, 
scientific crisis. idea yeah. that nobody agrees on, right? 97% of scientists agree with, yeah, because <laughs> they paid all these people to do that study, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> they're going to lose their funding if they don't agree with what, you know, how this how somebody wanted the study to come out. Correct. When we're faced with real problems, we adapt and we prevail. And there's a lot of really, really good, smart people out there that are continuing to work. Like, just look at the work that Green Cover's doing. I mean, they're they're farmers. They saw an area where they wanted to, they saw something that they could do. And they started a business. And now he's, you know, like you realize how it's it's a massive world, but it's a small world. But it's like, you know, he has probably done, he's probably talked to how many thousands of people directly, 14, 15,000 people watching a video on YouTube, if not more. Like people are getting touched, but there's millions of people out there. And how many farmers do you know? How many doctors do you know? How many all these different things that they don't have time to sit down at night and watch a YouTube video about how to do their farming different? Right. You know, it's like my daddy did this this way for the last forty years, and my granddaddy and this like right. people aren't. I and I, I I had this revelation at the doctor the other day because you know I, I drive around and listen to podcasts all day, so I'm like this freaking expert, right? But then you go and I see this with my wife too because she's in the medical field. But, like, she goes to work, and, and she doesn't have an earbud in to listen to podcasts. Right. And then she comes home at night, and it's nonstop with the kids and the family, and then you go to bed and get up again. There's a lot of people in their own industry that they don't – they're not given and allotted that time right. like you and I have. You're right. an overnight worker and working on machines. Like, you can throw an earbud in and listen to podcasts. Educate right. yourself. A lot of people that are experts in their thing that they do That's what don't they have the opportunity to – expand their knowledge base and hear other people's perspectives and ways of doing things. Right. And that's my hope with this. Like, this is what gets me fired up about this podcast is like, this can get out there to whoever. Mm -hmm. And it can, if we educate one person and that one person can do that. And whether they're a farmer or they are a land manager or whatever. Yeah. It's just, it's like, it's having these broad conversations that just make people think about stuff. Because if we just keep marching down the road, listening to all the designated experts out there about this is the way you got to do it. And this is the only way to fix this problem. I just, there's more than one way to skin a cat. That's what it comes down to. God. <laughs> Fire it off, Dallas. Yeah. And we're going to start a seed company. We're going to start distributing seed. I'm, I'm all excited about that. I heard that. Like I listening to his stuff yesterday, seeing all the work you're doing and I, I don't think there's a lot of people doing what, what we're doing right now in this area. And I think there's a lot of people that they're not doing it because they just don't know where to start. Yeah. So it's like, you know, Ben Ben just explained to us the other night how fast all that grain went that he just started bagging it up. And it was like two weeks. Yeah. And he sold everything he had. Right. Because people just, I'm the same way. It's like, I don't know. I'm listening to all this stuff, but I'm like, I'll go to Agway and stand there or go to the local grain mill and it's like, Honestly, I don't know what I want. where we could help even more is the how-to. Right. And we try to do that on the podcast, but... It's, I think we should do some sort of, of field, like field yeah. day, like have people come out. Or just, you know... Just I'm ask doing, questions. I'm doing yeah. some consulting already, but it's just with my friends, and I'm just, you know, and a lot of it's not even on site. We're yeah. just talking, and when I talk about a lot of these concepts, I get a positive reaction, but then sometimes I know they turn around and just... You know, they're like, oh, I know Dale has said all this stuff, but I'm just going well, yeah, to get my tiller out. I know. Just, because it is difficult, it's, you know, and, and they don't have a two-row corn planter like I do, you know. Yeah, it's pretty special we're pretty in blessed. That regard, yeah. but, and a 1950-something Ford to pull it. Yeah. yeah, but there's a lot of ways to, to skin a cat, like you said. But, you know, consulting and then and then providing a bag of seed to say that, okay, because that's the next hurdle is, okay, I did all my prep work. Now I have to go and, you know, it, and like I said, you know, usually they end up just going to the, to the, uh, the tractor supply, even, yeah. buying a bag of throwing go <clears> or <throat> tractor supply or, or Cabela's or whatever, and just buying a, a bag of shit. That's not, you know, there's some good things in there, but you know, those, those bag seed companies with the, the buck on the bag, they're running a business and trying to make money. They're giving recommendations so that their product will look like it's working and that you'll come back and buy it again. That's it. They're not 
And they can't. You can't write on a bag, this is how you do it, unless you give a generic recommendation. That, Like I said, you read the back of most seed bags, and they're going to say you need to prepare a, a, a seed bed one to two inches deep of tillage. Make sure all the weeds, you know, disc it twice or three times to make sure all the weeds are killed along with all the soil biology, right? <laughs> So that's that not you, even talked about on the bed. So that yeah. you can put your, you can get a good seed, good firm seed bed so that you'll have a high germination rate, time it with water, and then fertilize the fuck out of it. And that the artificial inputs will overcome the soil biology being totally ruined. And then you'll have a nice green lush food plot and you'll feel really good about it. And you're like, God damn, that, that food in a bag worked great. I'm going to go buy 10 of them next year instead of one because it works so good but you're doing every single thing wrong to achieve that result. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's something that we can definitely, we can definitely do moving forward. I think there's opportunities to get out there and work with people in different ways and whether it's just directly communicating here and, or, you know, simply just we're buying all this seed for ourselves. And if we can mix up some stuff and, you know, we've talked about that, it's, you know, we're buying a lot of this stuff from, from green cover and from other, you know, you're getting a few things from, from some other places, but you know, we've got, I'm down to at this point, I get it from Reisdorf's locally or I get it from green cover. Yeah. That's, that's but I mean, if we can order stuff in as at a, on a pallet quantity instead of on a, you know, on I've a one box pallets from them, you have. Yeah. So it's just, it's something for us to think about because I think it could be a great resource for people to just reach out to us. And, and then it, again, back to that piece of, you know, I think it'd be cool to have an opportunity to, you know, maybe have Ben and John come out and have us out and we'll go out to the farm and have invite any of the listeners that want to come out and kind of see what we're doing and how we're doing it to just see it. Like, you know, go look at that field, the, the garden food plot that, you know, two years ago was well, a year ago was a, was a goldenrod field. Yeah. Now it's seven foot tall of 12 yeah. different things. And I think that a lot of people like, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't even know where to start with that stuff. Like, right. and I'm not doing it; you're doing it. But like, I wouldn't know where to, you go. Oh, here's a goldenrod field. Go make this into a. Yeah, and that is the toughest challenge, and that's why Ben brought it up. I mean, Ben's a, a professional. Yeah, and he wants to know advice on how to turn that goldenrod field, and that's and I've struggled with it too. I've done it, but it but I usually it takes a year or two to really get it going because it's it's just hard to. Even when you kill all that canary grass is what we're dealing with usually. That once you kill it, then you have this thick layer of thatch. And I've tried to, this year I was like, oh, I'm just going to drill through that shit with our corn planter. Didn't work. Yeah. Because it just shoves the, all those all long the grasses, the- shoves them down in there. I even threw up the white flag this year and said, I'm going to try a tiller on some of it. And guess what? The fucking long grass just winds around the tiller and jams that thing up. So even that, even I even cried uncle and said oh i'm gonna just try this the thing that i'm so against that i won't ever do i tried it and even that failed (laughs) yeah right so that that starting a new one is tough and also like if you have to clear trees and you have to deal with stumps you know a lot of our stuff we just have to clear some buckthorn and but even that's tough because you cut it your your best bet's almost just to cut it as flush to the ground as you can and then just drive over it like it's not even there yeah because last year we left stumps, and then you drove over them with your roller and ruined your brain. <laughs> Hammered that. Yeah, I didn't see that stump and the buck and the buckwheat. You you threaten you you risk popping tires on that and whatnot, or getting caught on it. So then I've tried ripping them up with the skid loader, and that sure that works, but then it leaves a big damn hole in the ground. And then I'm trying to back scrape the hole in the ground. So yeah, starting these new ones, it is the toughest thing because there's almost no really good answer to it. I almost just want to say least disturbance as possible and just, and that's what I've done. But, you know, if you got rocks and stumps and shit that you need to go around or drive over, you know, cut them to the ground or, or leave them high like those hickory trees and just left them yeah. two just feet high them. just so that you can't miss it. Yep. And you just drive around them and it, it ultimately it's a food plot. Yeah. So the deer don't care if there's a spot there that nothing's planted. They'll just go and eat wherever you did it. Right. <clears throat> but that is... And what I was wondering if he was going to bring up fire because that's actually in that that thatch. The best way to be to do is kill it so everything is dead and dry and then burn it. But 
as far as I understand, we're not supposed to be doing yeah, that I don't in think New York State. To, yeah. And and even if you were, that's another level of expertise that would have to. And now that's like that's what a lot of the best managers are doing is they use fire. I mean, Grant uses fire all the time, you know, and that's that's. But a lot of his stuff isn't even food plots. It's just his his. Uh, you know, when you take a a timber cut and then you burn it, and then you let that natural vegetation grow back. And then you burn it every. You, you got to keep doing it every couple of years too. Right. You don't really have fire as an option. I kind of wish we do. I think that'd be another fun thing to play around. Yeah, with. it would. Yeah. So yeah, it's a fun conversation. A lot of, a lot of good stuff there. And I've been talking about this stuff a lot for the last year or two, and sometimes just having an expert to confer with, you know. And have it recorded because usually my conversations usually don't start until after I've had a couple of beers, <laughs> and uh, the other people have too. So yeah. then it's like the next day you're like, "What did we talk about?" But uh, I don't know. I would like to get if we can get Keith back at some point. I would like to get a guy like Brad Allmeter on here and give a farmer's perspective. That'd be really cool, yeah. And let him ask some questions. Maybe if we could even do it at night, where we could get some more listeners with some Q and A. And get, uh, like, I would love to, well, in, in, like Mike said, like Mike's not that he's more in the commodity side of their operation than the day to day in the field, but it'd be really cool to get, you know, someone like Brad, absolutely. Who's out in the field working and, yeah. and on that stuff, it'd be cool to get a farmer's and perspective. On like I said, Brad's things. not resistant to these ideas. He just doesn't know how to implement them yeah. because he's running in an, an enormous operation Yeah, and everything and he's takes got three time kids and home. money. <laughs> yeah. So. Be, a guy, the other to, day I brought it up to him. I was curious because they're, they're putting that new lagoon in over there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was wondering if they've thought at or thought about or looked at one of those um, um, anaerobic digesters to, you know, to, to create methane and, and use that as a fuel for equipment and stuff. I'm just curious if they've looked into it. And he's like, I've heard about it. He's like, I know there's some people doing it. But he's like, I, I – it's like I just I haven't I don't know enough about it, right. and it's certainly something the size of the farm they are. It's certainly something that they could probably economically they could do. Mm-hmm. But what are the pros and the cons of it? You know, I've heard some negatives that you know that fuel is it's there's a lot of moisture in that fuel. It's it's kind of a dirtier. It's not that it's a dirty dirty fuel, but it's a it's a not a clean burning fuel in an engine, and it can break down engines pretty quickly if you're if that's the only fuel you're running mm. them on but that's something that fascinates me as well you know that's a whole nother wormhole to go down but that's you know i see like boxlers are doing that they've got a huge digester down there that that's what they're doing with a lot of their mm. stuff i mean they've got huge transformers and this this gigantic whole system down there they're generating electricity for the farm with the digester oh which is incredible and and that's they're using the waste product from the cows, the meth- yeah. the the methane, they're capturing it and yeah. fueling. So a lot of what goes on with farms is I, you know, I mentioned it before, but it's the the government grants. You know, but they're do they're doing these things. The government's offering incentives to try to get people to go in a direction f- that's good for the environment. And like I said, eventually a lot of them, you know, they're going to put that carrot out there for so long and say, you know, before eventually they say you're going to have to start doing these things right not not all of these things you know but a good portion of them for sure i mean they're already mandated you know when they build new buildings the water collection system and the runoff even the runoff from the bunks and and the things like that that they've had to even the all meters have had to go and fix existing systems Mm. to to meet regulation they must you have know. traps or something to catch different. Yeah, like the runoff, you know, the bunks, the silage bunks, they have waste that comes out of them, and, the mm-hmm. wa- and the, you know, water gets in them and runs them into the same thing, the water Oh, waste. and that's, that's what the, the Hipshas put one of them in below their <laughs> barn. That's what they did yeah. right below um, Denise and Larry's house. Yeah. And it's all kind of feathered in there, and it runs all the way down the hill, so it must be some sort of, like, catch system to filter. It yeah. filters out the waste and the, the byproducts. Yeah. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah. There's a lot going on with the farms. There's a lot more modern stuff, modern ideas that are going on within these farms already. So they're already they already have their hands in this stuff. It's it's only a matter of time before it spreads into the farming practices, the you know, out in the field right. more than it already is. Right. 
there's already regulations, but I think that pretty soon there's there's going to be a set way of doing things. But but the stuff that we're talking about, the regenerative stuff, that's going to end up being good for the farms. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. It's just a change. Different equipment, different approaches, and more work in some ways because you're going to have to, you know, terminate some of that stuff in a different method than what you've done before. And But it's... But ultimately, yeah. once you have a system, it's an easier system. Right. It's a more profitable system. So it's good for everybody. Yeah. Well, there you go, Dallas. <laughs> and on a bright note, we got work to do. So we'll wrap this thing up. It's a great chat. Thanks for linking us up with uh, with Keith. I think hopefully that's a reoccurring guest and, and uh, a company we can start doing some more work with. Uh, sure. You know, become the beast of the East and selling, <laughs> uh, you know, the grain. We're going to start competing with Howlett Farms and uh, an old tin cup. We're going to, we're just going to, we're going to be slinging grain out of that barn. We're going to have to get licenses and everything, T-shirts. <laughs> be huge, fading them. Yeah. That's good stuff. All right, buddy. Thank you. Appreciate you uh, being my co-host. As God knows, Big Jim's not reliable, and Danny Boy. Do, who is – do we know Danny? Do we even know I Danny? I don't know a Danny. <laughs> I don't – never met a guy. <laughs> All right, Dallas, thank you. All right, Bill. See you.